Now let's dig into our archives and hear a rare interview when Billy C. first became the champion of Boxing Talk Radio. Uh, hello, Billy C. As the new champ, can we ask you a few questions? Why, certainly. Okay, your fans would like to know how you and your corner have successfully walloped the competition. We're not ordinary people. We're morons. Anything else? I'm a victim of circumstance. Did your success finally come when you made the show five days a week for two hours? What do you think? I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Now, please tell the listeners what you've learned from making it this far. Certainly. If it's a place you don't succeed, keep on sucking till you do succeed. Great words of wisdom, Billy C. Keep up the great work as the undisputed people's champion with your show, Talkin' Boxing with Billy C. Any last words to anyone who's listening? This is your fault, you bonehead. <laughs> yeah. And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. She show. <laughs> hey, Porky. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show here on Fox Sports Radio WMML 1230. Glad you could join us. And uh, speaking of joining us, it's about that time again. Last from the past. We shine the spotlight again on fighters from years Rocky past. Marciano, top ranking Joe Lewis is the leading contender. Joe Frazier with a left hook. Good right hand thrown by Foreman that time. Look at that left that hook. Belt that goes to Ray Van It's Blast from the Past on Talking Boxing. And this week's Blast from the Past, which is being sponsored by the International Boxing Organization, where their computerized ranking system is second to none. Check them out, www.iboboxing.com. Features a a former British uh, heavyweight champion, Bombardier Billy Wells. Now joining me, like usual, to tell us all about Bombardier Billy Wells is my man Alex Perpali. What's up, brother? Hello, Billy. How are you doing? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. Uh, I had a chuckle at your email today. Uh, oh, you 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 getting ready to get some snow or whatever you said. I'm like, I've already had it with the damn snow, man. What are you, we're getting more tomorrow and at the end of the week. Uh, it's I, I just can't take it, man. That's why that's why I want to you know head south, bro. Yeah, huh? We must enjoy Florida. Well, it was actually a little chilly down there. It wasn't it wasn't as I, I could enjoy it much better when it's uh you know above fifty degrees. But uh uh anyway, Bombardier Billy Wells, interesting cat he is, huh? Yeah, you know, this was uh, uh an interesting guy. I um it's uh it, there's all kinds of uh qualities, um uh or, or all kinds of different levels of um skill that we do in this blast in the past because uh this guy is kind of the um I was going to say the British Tex Cobb of the teens, but um, <laughs> uh, he was he was not a slugger. He was more of a boxer, uh, and he was not all that durable. But um, he he did uh, get he got knocked out a few times. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, he got knocked out every time he lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he sure did. But he was so and, popular; they loved him in in England. I mean, uh, this guy was, uh, and even when we get to what he did later in life, it's pretty amazing. And, and he was he was a smart guy too. He, he well, t- well, tell us tell us about his early life. Okay, uh, so Bombardier Billy Wells. His uh, real name is actually William Thomas Wells, and he was born uh, August thirty first. Way back in 1889. Oh man, he was born uh, a couple of years before I was. <laughs> That's right. He's a little older than you. A little older. <laughs> yeah, and he was uh, born in the East End of London, um, and uh, he um, started boxing actually in the uh, artillery, where uh, as an artillery royal in the Royal Artillery as a gunner, and in a. Rawal Pindi, I guess he was stationed in India, Rawal Pindi, uh, and that's where he started boxing, and he won an all-India championships, um, and uh, he actually became one of the, known as one of the White Hopes um, once he became a professional boxer, 
and he was a heavyweight, six foot three. Um, you know, usually around 182, 192, that l- level. I and mean, these guys, people weren't as big as they are now. Um, but in that age when Jack Johnson was champion, so remember 1908 to 1915, uh, and, uh, he started his pro career at 1910, so and he was successful early. He was an excellent boxer, uh, very clever, and uh, was quickly lumped in uh, among the white hoax. You know, I, an interesting thing about this guy they, that really caught, you, you know, obviously you, you're saying to yourself, Billy C., what, what, what the hell are we doing this guy for? I mean, you know, um, I, but, but here's one of the things that, that really got me with, the, with him. First of all, you, you mentioned that he's six foot three. Now that's not a little guy. You know, we always have this tendency to look back at the fighters from yesteryear, especially the the era in which uh, Bombardier Billy Wells fought, and we don't think of fighters um, that are that big. Uh, you know, because they just weren't. You know, our heavyweight champions. I mean, Jack Johnson was considered a monster, and he was two hundred pounds. You know, and, and you know, you just don't think of these guys being six foot three. And when you did occasionally get a big guy, six foot three, six foot four, they generally, you know, were big kind of, you know, fat guys. You know, they were they were baby Hueys, the way I refer to them. This guy wasn't. He he would he could move around. He like you mentioned, he he weighed and his his best weight was between one eighty two and one ninety two, like you mentioned. At six foot three, that's a guy that seemingly was in good shape, don't you think? Yeah, I, I definitely think that he was fit and he was. Um uh, they, you know, there was times where they did seem to say that he put on some bulk in training camp and stuff, um, and that he his midsection looked thicker in some of his later fights. But um, you're right; he was um, for his height, he was a substantial guy, uh, and he 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 wasn't a slugger. He was more of a boxer anyway. So he used his left, uh, you know, to keep the guy outside. He was a rangy type of guy. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, that height and that reach for a six, three at the time, that's pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, he, his and he was quick, yeah, he was quick because he, he, he used the one, two, that was his thing. You know, he, he did use, uh, the jab a lot and, uh, he, he could move around. Now you mentioned that he fought in the beginning, uh, when he started his career, you know, uh, during the Jack Johnson time. And uh, interesting enough, uh, you know, one of the guy's names that I noticed uh, early in his career uh, was Porky Dan Flynn. Now, Porky Dan Flynn was was uh, a, a guy that fought all of those guys, James Jeffries and, and uh, uh, Jack Johnson, all during that time. And uh, uh, Bombardier Billy Wells uh, beat him in a 20-round decision in 1911, which was early in his career. It was only like his ninth or tenth fight, you know. So, you know, that's why I think he rose so quickly. And incidentally, he was matched uh, in, uh, uh, they were scheduled after that fight. uh, He was scheduled to fight Jack Johnson uh, in October of 1911. Uh, but check this out. Because of some religious movements by a, a Baptist minister whose name was Frederick uh, Brotherton Meyer, um, ended up getting the rules changed where they outlawed fights between the races in Britain, and it lasted all the way. And it was actually Winston Churchill uh, stepped in and canceled the fight. And it stayed in British boxing all the way till 1947, which is something that shocked the heck out of me. I never realized that, Alex, that that there was a, a color barrier in England. I always thought of England as being so much more advanced uh, than us when it when it comes to ridiculous things like that. Plus, both you and I, uh, you know, learned that there was no color barrier when Tom Molino fought Thomas Gribb in 1810. So it's uh, kind of strange to me. Wow, that is strange. Yeah, that they. Um they must have, uh, yeah, that's for them to institute it and then maintain it all the way to 1947. 47, wow. that was, that was. I mean, Joe Lewis was fighting. Wow. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, you yeah, know, I kn- he, Well, yeah, he was, and it was probably into the Jersey Joe Walcott and Edward Charles era. Yeah, I mean, um, but there was, for a while, and it was after that uh, Porky Flynn fight that um, they did, we're talking about matching um, Bombardier Billy Wells with Jack Johnson. But well, that's what I'm saying. Be, yeah, it never got beyond talk. And maybe that, I, I wonder if just the talk of it uh, 
created the the law. Yeah, that's uh, no, no. What happened was it was scheduled in October of 1911. This is what I'm telling you. It, the yeah, fight had I been scheduled in London right after the Porky Dan Flynn fight, and uh, and and then the fight ended up getting canceled because they changed the rules and and the. Uh, the Baptist minister that that started the ball rolling ended up getting Winston Churchill to step in. I mean, wow, <laughs> pretty. Oh, big, I, I thought it was. I, I thought it was a, a, a bizarre twist to uh, to this guy's uh, uh, story. Especially, what I think what what was even more fascinating to me was that it it took place to begin with. You know, I, I mean, I, I found that pretty strange. But I didn't want to spend that much time on it. But um, you know, I, another interesting thing about. Uh, well, it which, shows you that racism also was a worldwide thing. Yeah, and but but the thing is, is that we're so quick to to think that you know, specifically England was was so much further along, uh, not being prejudiced than we were here in the United States. You know, and here we see that you know, in my opinion, you know, having a color line up until 1947 wasn't much different than here in the states. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's it's a shame. It's true. That's true, but the, and that was um, what that was interesting because it was soon after that fight uh, or the, that fight being scheduled, and then him coming here, uh, he had the win over uh, Fred Storbuck, Storbeck in um, London in December of um, of uh, nineteen eleven, and then the next fight was I think that's his new yet New York de- debut, yeah. And before that fight, I actually did find a little quote here in the uh, Tex Rickard book by um, Colleen Acock and uh, Mark Scott. Before, before the fight with Paulzer, they talked to Tex Rickard and got him, they asked him, they said, uh, here's, this is quoting from the book, how about that Englishman uh, Bombardier Wells? You have been quoted as speaking enthusiastically of him, the writer asked. Rickard hesitated before replying and then said, Wells is a very good man, well-built, fast and clever with his hands and feet, and might beat the rest of the white men now. He is of the Jim Corbett type. He is well thought of in England. He got a lot of prestige out of being matched with Johnson. But it is luck for him that the fight was prevented. Had the fight come off as as scheduled, Wells perhaps wouldn't be enjoying the same popularity today. So that was Rickard's opinion, that he did think that... um, you know, Johnson would have blown through him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Al Pal, uh, the fight that, you know, he made his debut in New York against uh, Palzer, he, he was stopped in three rounds. But but they, was, it, yeah. it seemed like they were trying to get him here in the States because they put him right back in in New York uh, against Tom Kennedy, and he won't, got the win. And then uh, he had to go up against, uh, uh, he went back to the U.K. for a fight, but then he went up against uh, Gumboat Smith. Who's, and got destroyed. Uh, and there. got destroyed. And Gumbo Smith actually held, and, and it doesn't show up on, on box rip, but Gumbo Smith was was had held the white. They they kind of shovel that under the carpet a little bit, but they started uh, when Jack Johnson was a champion. They started crowning the world the white world heavyweight champion, and even Gumbo Smith said himself that it was, and he was really really prejudiced. He was he was a racist a hundred percent. But he said that he never considered himself a champion because there was only one belt, and uh, then he would, you know, say that with the N word, that that you know, that Jack Johnson's got the belt, you know, and and but I, I thought that that at least as, as as terrible as he was in terms of racist, as, at least he recognized that Jack Johnson had the real belt, you know. True, true. <laughs> yeah, um, Palzer. Uh, I think that fight with Palzer was for the white heavyweight championship. Oh yeah, yeah. You see, and uh, I didn't. You know, That's I don't have the, it. the article mentioned it, but I don't see it listed on Cyber Boxing Zone or on Boxrec. And and I think well, it shouldn't be because it really wasn't. Um, it was not a real title. I mean, it was some. It was uh, a, a sort of pro- promotional gimmick that appealed to the ugliness of the time. Yeah, and and you know what else though? And, and I it, this is off the subject a little bit. But why did they pick and choose when to list the colored? titles as well because there was so many colored titles fought for and sometimes you see them listed and sometimes you don't you know i mean and that's not fair because i mean look at sam langford you look at his uh record and you know he had held the colored version of the heavyweight title for a while and it's not even on there you know and the same thing i think um i think burley uh charlie burley had a middleweight version of it as well but anyway 
um, Bombardier Billy Wells, interesting thing about him, uh, which I found, uh, I, 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 and you, I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, he was the uh, uh, BBBSC heavyweight champion, which uh, they donned the Lonsdale belt. And apparently he had the original belt that was, you know, filled with, with all kinds of gems and stuff like that. Uh, that goes way back. Um, it's not the same one that's used today. So, I, you know, when I when I learned this, I'm saying to myself, did they actually pass the belt along? Like, in other words, here's the championship belt. You get it. When you lose it, you, you lose possession of that belt and give it to the next guy. Unlike what they do now, where you win a title, it's your belt really forever. You get to keep that belt in your showcase when you lose it, technically, the next guy gets a new belt. He's not getting that same one that you had. What did you? How did, what do you think about that? I don't know. Uh, I don't know for sure. I really think that that would be pretty cool if it is the same belt. And I wouldn't be all that surprised because I think there is mention of that. Um, I think I didn't find all that much on this guy, but the Wikipedia entry is um, uh, pretty pretty lengthy for him. And you know the sources that they list aren't, aren't um, you know the they're they're newspapers so that's you know usually that and it does say something about that that the original belt um, is on display somewhere. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll read you the quote. It says the Lonsdale belt that he won was the original. This is the wording was the original heavyweight belt, and it's crafted from twenty two carat gold, unlike the other uh, later belts. Uh, the BBC, the BBC London has managed to track down this specific belt, and it it can uh, uh, the belt is being kept at the Royal Artillery Barracks in Woolwich, South East London. It's not on display, but it's there. I, I just found the, yeah, the, it's, it's private viewing only or something. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. I wonder because maybe it was a time like you're saying that. Um, they did uh, have the one belt, and and if you became champion, you took it over. Yeah, and and then like I, Stanley Cup, right? And 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 that adds a huge significance to the to to having these belts, you know, and and talk about lineage, you know. So I found that interesting uh, about this guy. Plus the fanfare, how they they loved him in England. This guy was uh, extremely popular, and he was no dummy either. And and uh, after he finished his boxing career, he did pretty well. Yeah, I didn't um, see too much about that, and I was not able to find a, an obituary. I mean, I only saw, uh, you know, the bio info on Wikipedia, but um, I was hoping to find a, an actual uh, um, obituary from 67 when he passed away. I did see one of them, uh, one article that was a little longer, uh, a little more descriptive about him in training for that gun, Gunboat Smith fight that he fought in New York, which was another one where, or no, was it the Frank Moran? You know, uh, and yeah, he every time he stepped up with some of those names, um, he got, you know, they laid waste to him. Frank Moran knocked him out in 10 rounds. Uh, George Carpentier knocked him out in four. Gunboat Smith stopped him in two. But the uh, article, when he was training in Long Island, or he was training in New York City for that bout with uh, Gunboat Smith, he was training with a Long Island fighter uh, named Jack McFarland, who I did find him. I think it must be the same guy. There's a guy on box rec who only had a couple of fights. Um, but uh, it's that they describe a workout, and they describe, like, the, the small gloves they, you know, that he liked to use and um, how he dropped him in sparring, but then he, you know, went over and helped him up. Uh, so it really, he, like you were saying, he, he was a popular guy. Uh, he was a... Uh, very for the time, you know, there was something about him that was uh, photogenic, and uh, you know, you put good fights together with a guy like that. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, people definitely liked him. And uh, after he finished his boxing career, he he put out a couple of books in 1911. Actually, while he was still fighting, he put out a book called uh, Modern ba Boxing: A Practical Guide to Present Day Methods, which is kind of this. He put that out in 1911. It would be interesting to see that. Um, uh, he, uh, the other thing is, is it's funny. He got married. It's not funny, but he got married, had five kids. Then they got a divorce, which was unusual back then, you know, uh, which I thought was, uh, uh, interesting. And then he put out a second book in 1923 
called physical energy, showing how physical and mental energy can be developed by means of practicing boxing, which, uh, you know, to me, both of those books actually, well, the one in 1911, not so much, but definitely the one in 23 seemed ahead of his time. Yeah, that does, uh, definitely. I mean, he, um, oh, wait a minute, I do have something here. Um, Hen Henry, I just checked on um, Facebook, and Henry did send me something. Well, check um, this out. While you're getting that together, um, the um, uh, the J. Arthur Rank films were, uh, you know, product production uh, J. Arthur Rank, uh, there was always a guy that was uh, hitting the gong, you know, as they were coming, you know, like the MGM, uh, the Lion Roars, where they would have a guy hitting the gong. And that's who Bombardier Billy Wells was actually the third person in in history to be the gong man for the for that uh, for that production company, which I thought was kind of cool too, you know. Yeah, I just see that, and that that's mentioned in this uh, this article that he just sent me. Um, yeah, and he. Yeah, he definitely um, was a popular guy. He went on, I guess one of the books was about uh, physical energy. Um, and mental, that's what I was saying. It, the, the title of the book, he not only, he, 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 he introduces applying not only physical, but mental energy uh, through the use of boxing for, for positive, you know, for positive results, which, which is all about today. I mean, that's, that's what a lot of these so-called trainers are doing today. They're, they're approaching the mental aspect of the game. And here, this guy was not only a fighter, um, but he put a book about it in 1923. You know, maybe if he put a book on how to, you know, avoid the knockout, uh, maybe you wouldn't have bought it since he was knocked out in every fight that he lost, you know? Yeah, for Hilly. But, yeah, I mean, he definitely... Um uh, you know, wanted to share what he learned, and he went on to, um, and he could, you know, he did box well, that's for sure. You know, I mean, it, maybe he didn't, some guys don't have the chin, uh, you know, to just handle, especially being a heavyweight, um, but he did uh, um, train uh, fighters in, um, he trained troops in uh, the First World War. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, he was in World War One. Yeah, I guess that's how he started. That's how he started the. Uh, that's how he started boxing. But no, it looks like that was actually at the once he was done as a professional because uh, it's. Oh no, okay, he must have gone back to boxing because yeah, it's 1917. He was uh, went to France and was t helping train the troops. Yeah, yeah, but uh, his career ended in 25. It started. Oh, yeah, in yeah, there's 19, a whole break 10. in 17. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, who did you put him up against in uh, the title bout game? I put him up against um, who's ranked number one, which oh. of course <laughs> there should be no surprise, is ranked number one at BillyCBoxing.com, and that is Vladimir Klitschko. And against Vlad Klitschko, the first time they fought, uh, Vlad knocked him out in two rounds. Um, Klitschko dropped him in the first and then knocked him out in the second at 227 of the second. Um, I had them fight a hundred times, and out 100 of one hundred, <laughs> uh, Billy was two and ninety-eight. Yeah, but well. those two wins, he did win by knock. There you go. <laughs> and yeah, and Vlad stopped him ninety-four for freaking times. And um, then uh, I put him up against the number two ranked at WC Boxing, and you guys have uh, Berman Stavern, and uh, in their first fight. Uh, it was interesting. The referee was Steve Smoger, oh, uh, which the referees, unless you assign them, they're assigned randomly. Um, and against Stavern, Stavern won by a TKO. Uh, Smoger penalized uh, Billy Wells for hitting behind the head in round number two, and he lost a point for that. And then he was dropped in the fourth, fourth by Stavern and stopped on his feet, taking a shellacking at 244, round number five. Um, out of 100 fights with Berman Stavern, uh, Billy was 14 and 86, 13 of those wins by stoppage. Stavern knocked him out 75 of those 86 wins. And then, just for the hell of it, I put him in against everybody's favorite current heavyweight, uh, Deontay Wilder, who is ranked number 10 at Billy C. Boxing. And Wilder won a majority decision in their first fight, which was actually a pretty damn good fight. And Deontay put Wells down twice in round six, but was unable to finish him. 
and then Wells had Wilder down in the eighth. And Wilder won the majority decision, 115-112, to 112, 114, 113, and then one even card of 113-113. In the rematch, Wells was down and hurt badly in the second. He guts it out only to be stopped by knockout in the fifth at 1 minute and 37 seconds. Out of 100 versus Deontay Wilder, Billy was 14-85-1. and one. Twelve of those 14 wins by stoppage, and Wilder stopped him. 77 of those 85 wins. So I guess it's safe to say that Bombardier Billy Wells isn't going to get into the Hall of Fame anytime soon. No, he is definitely not on anybody's top 10 uh, greatest heavyweight. Pa- 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 but he was fun to learn about, that's for sure. <laughs> he definitely was. I, 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 I stumbled across him. You know, One of these days, uh, you, you and I, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you some stuff about how I get these. I got some interesting names coming up. One is actually kind of a sad story, man, but uh, I, I want to share it with you uh, off the air. But uh, anyway, Bombardier Billy Wells, uh, former uh, uh, British uh, BBBSC heavyweight champion. His career record, 41 wins, 34 coming by knockout. He did have 11 losses. All of those came by stoppage. He never had a draw in his career. Uh, he was six foot three, had a 79-inch reach. Um, he fought, like Alex said, between 182 and 192 pounds at six foot three. 324 rounds as a pro with a 65% knockout ratio. Now, there was one thing I found. Uh, there's two dates that they have listed for his birth, uh, both the same day, August 31st. Two, uh, one says 1889, one says 1887. Uh, if you go by the 1889 uh, birth date, he died at 77 years old in 1967. Bombardier Billy Wells uh, was uh, a character. People liked him, and he was our blast from the past today. So uh, great job, as usual, on that, Alex. Um, 